Chris Trump for kaijupop.com and welcome back to this month in video gaming history. Happy old year as we take a look at January 1985 and we start things off with a pair of Nintendo games. One arcade port and one original. First, Balloon Fight Then. Uh, this appeared in arcades in 1984 and was ported over across to the Famicom uh, in January of 1985. To Western arcade goers in 1985, Balloon Fight looked pretty familiar. In fact, it looked incredibly familiar. Balloon Fight was basically um, a rip-off of Atari's Joust uh, from a few years prior, except instead of struggling jousting ostriches by landing on them with your bird backside, um, what you were doing here is, well, you had few human protagonists and antagonists uh, that were floating around with balloons. Uh, much like in Joust, you sort of bop the, uh, the enemies as opposed to jousting them uh, with your backside in order to pop their balloons, at which point they would land on platforms and then it's up to you to, to kick them into the abyss. Um, you had to sort of stay afloat with some tricky inertia driven controls here um, and try and stay above the water at the bottom of the screen lest a monster uh, pick you out of the air. It was very, very, very strangely similar uh, to Joust, and it was surprising that there wasn't more of a fuss kicked up by Atari. Bear in mind, Atari and Nintendo have bad blood. Going back to failed negotiations over bringing the Famicom to the West in 1984. Still, uh, there was something that separated Balloon Fight, uh, on the, in the home version at least, uh, from Joust and Balloon Fight in the arcades, and that was the Balloon Trip mode. This was kind of similar to the Endless Runners that we see today, uh, without the enemies to fight that you could uh, fight off in single player or cooperative two player mode. Uh, in Balloon Trip, it was solely a single player experience and it was a see how far you could get kind of thing as you avoided the stars and managed to collect more balloons for more points. It's an awful lot of fun. Uh, very, very tricky, as kind of Endless Runners are these days, and, uh, well, I mean, the difference between this and many other Endless Runners is that you could still control your guy using the D-pad in a much more, sort of, uh, literal sense than many Auto Runners do, um, but it wouldn't be that hard to, to think that Balloon Trip had a fairly heavy influence on the Cannibals, the Temple Runs, and yes, the Flappy Birds of many years later. Next up, Ice Climber on the Famicom, a Famicom original, although there would be a port back the other way into arcades as versus Ice Climber later on. This was a, well, a very arcade style game despite being built for the home. It was a case of see how far you could get as you controlled Popo, or if you were playing in two player, Popo and Nana as well, the Ice Climbers as they ventured up a mountain, 32 different mountains in fact, starting at the bottom and working their way up to a bonus section at the top before moving on to the next hill to climb. Uh, the idea here sort of was to bump platforms uh, from underneath with your head in order to dislodge them and make a gap for you to fit up as, as you jumped upwards. You also had an attack button with which to deal with uh, many of the nasty enemies that would start sort of humbly patrolling uh, but then sort of factor in extra irritating elements like uh, dropping ice blocks in your path and things like that or in the case of the birds swooping down to attack you. Um, it was a decent concept, but uh, in many ways would frustrate gamers for years to come, in such a way that it's one of those odd pieces of Nintendo's history that's trotted out every now and again. Uh, Popo and Nana often appear in games like Smash Brothers, for example, uh, but they're not altogether welcome. Ice Climbers today handles pretty terribly, uh, partly because it I think helped create the idea of the slippy slidey ice world with its slippy slidey platforming. Um, balloon fight, well that was kind of part of the idea to have these very inertia heavy controls, but in Ice Climber just the barest touch sending you skidding across surfaces is incredibly frustrating. And the jumping, well forget about it, it's incredibly indistinct and most of the time you jump through and clearly land on a platform above uh, only for the game to deny you and to have you fall down 
it's a frustrating, frustrating experience. Um, but with Little Like It on the Famicom at the time, uh, it was fairly popular and uh, the European versions and the US versions of the game would occasionally be bundled in with NES hardware in years to come, earning it a bigger reputation in the West uh, than it had in Japan. Still, there were far bigger and more significant platformers to come out of 1985 later on. Finally, the sole big British release in a quiet January of 1985, Doom Dark's Revenge. The follow-up to Lords of Midnight, Mike Singleton's uh, seminal strategy RPG. Doom Dark's Revenge took a similar idea of the game that was released a year prior, uh, but expanded on it uh, with more mechanic mechanics and a more intricate and involved world. Much like in Lords of Midnight, the idea here was to recruit uh, members of different factions to your cause in a turn-based uh, system where you also had an enemy in the form of Sharath, an enemy leader that was also gathering the, the same leaders to her cause as well, and uh, then you would all kind of battle it out. It used a mixture of text and graphics, and had a very sort of text, you know, text adventure game kind of an interface um, with some added uh, sort of options allowing people to rest at certain times, move at certain times, um, and give a little bit more freedom in terms of where and when and how to interact with enemies and engage in combat. Um, there were a lot more systems, a lot more magic items to be found in Doom Dark's Revenge, and, um, and in the sequel as opposed to Lords of Midnight, there were a lot more ring conditions on your side. While the enemy uh, was just trying to kill you off, you had a bunch of different objectives, ranging from rescuing your captured son uh, to outright trying to destroy Shark and, and uh, completely overtake the kingdom. Uh, it's a game that doesn't really play well today, uh, as its remake on iOS kind of proved uh, that came out recently after Mike Singleton sadly passed. Um, but its significance can't be, you know, it can't be understated. Its influence on things like the Elder Scrolls games. Um, and perhaps Dragon Age uh, Inquisition and the like much later on, uh, it's fairly easy to see. And this broad, almost kind of open world uh, kind of experience was, was huge at the time. And Doom Dark's Revenge was a very justifiable and, and you know, a, a perfectly decent sequel, which is surprising given the short turnaround uh, from Lords of Midnight. So that's January 1985. You can read more about video games uh, in history from January 1985, 1995, and 2005 on kaijupop.com.